Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. I'm back after the summer break. Uh, today I want to look at a problem that involves free fall, except I'm going to add a little bit of air resistance to make it a little bit harder. So what we're going to do, we're going to start off with the model for air resistance that I'm going to use. We'll do a free body diagram. I'll then apply Newton's second law to that diagram. Uh, write down an equation of motion. Uh, we're going to look at the solution in kind of the short time limit and what happens after a very long time. And at the end, we're going to do some calculus and actually get the complete solution of the velocity as a function of time and make sure everything makes sense. So again, with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. And also, if you like my channel, uh, please consider subscribing. If you have any questions about the video or anything else, feel free to send me an email or leave it in the comments section. I'll get back to you. All right, let's get started. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna consider an object. This object is just gonna be a ball, for example, and the ball has a certain mass. Therefore, there is a weight acting down, right? The Earth is pulling down on this, and the magnitude of that force is m times little g. All right, now in addition to this, what I'm gonna do here is I'm also gonna add a resistive force. When this goes down, it interacts with the air around it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can model resistive forces. Uh, in this case here, I'm going to take the simplest possible resistive force and I'm going to call it B multiplied by the velocity of the object. Now, in some cases, if you look in the textbooks, uh, typically you might see a negative sign. Uh, the negative sign typically only tells you the direction of this force and clearly the direction is always opposite of the velocity. So that's why they kind of put that there. But we know an object that is going to just release from rest is going to fall down. Therefore, we've already taken the direction into consideration in this diagram. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to eliminate this. There is no need for it. We have the direction of this force, and that is the magnitude of that force. So have a look at a couple limits, right? Initially, what do we have initially? If I just drop the object, if we drop it, drop that ball, that means that the velocity at time zero has to be zero. So... If I look at this equation, if I substitute zero in this equation, means that my resistive force, at least initially, has to be zero. <laughs> and then what happens? Well, as I start getting faster, right, as I start accelerating downward, this force here is actually going to get bigger. And it's going to continue to get bigger until this resistive force is equal to the weight. So let's see. So this is initially what we have um, after a long time. Let's write that down. After a long time, what we're going to have is both forces will balance. So we're going to have that the resistive force is going to be equal to the weight. So we're going to have that B multiplied by V. That's the magnitude of our resistive force. And this is really going to be my final speed. I can never get faster than that. This is what they call this terminal velocity. And if I rearrange my equation now, an expression for my terminal velocity is going to be given by this. Simply the weight of that object, mg, and I bring the b downstairs over here, uh, divided by b. Uh, this here is the expression for the terminal velocity for this type of resistive force. So initially I'm going to have zero if I just drop the object, and eventually my final speed uh, should be this one down over here, simply the weight divided by that constant. One more thing I want to look at are what are the dimensions of this constant? Uh, again, if we just look at the dimensions of this resistive force, uh, this guy we know are in newtons. Let's use a square bracket to denote the units. And that has to be in units of kilograms, meters per second squared. That means the units of this side must also be in kilograms, meters per second squared. So let's have a look. So I'm going to have the units of B multiplied by the units of velocity, which are meters per second. So at the end, what I can do is I can just simplify this a little bit. I can cancel out a meter. I can cancel out one of the seconds. And what I'm left with right here are the units of this uh, constant over here, this resistive constant, which are going to be measured in kilograms uh, per second. All right, now let's go to the next page. We'll write down Newton's second law, and then we'll talk about uh, some limiting cases as well. All right, what I want to do now is I want to apply Newton's second law to this problem. We have forces, two forces acting on the system. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the down direction is going to be my positive direction. Uh, 
And I need a coordinate system when I write down Newton's second law. Uh, Newton's second law, remember, says that the net force, uh, which simply equals to the sum of all the forces acting on that object, have to be equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration of that object. Now this term over here, the sum of the forces, must include two terms, the weight and this resistive force. And both of these forces are in opposite directions, so we've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, let me start off with, the, with this side over here, MA. That doesn't change. And now I'll add up all the forces. So I have the force acting down, which is the weight, MG. And I have the resistive force acting up, minus B times V. All right, this is it. This is Newton's second law. It says mass times acceleration equals the sum of the forces, and these are in opposite directions. So again, if you have a look at the beginning, let's look at those limiting cases again. So we're going to have the short time, short T, and long T. Remember what we said initially. Initially, if we just drop the object, that means that this initial velocity have to, has to be equal to zero. So that means that this entire term here goes away. And that means our acceleration is simply going to be the acceleration due to gravity. And that's just what we have, right? So in the short time limit, this is going to behave very, very similar to your standard free fall problem. In the long time limit, what happens, again, this term over here starts getting bigger and bigger as time goes on. And eventually it's equal to the weight. And when that happens, the acceleration goes, zero, goes to zero. And this is when we have our terminal velocity, right? The thing doesn't just keep accelerating and the velocity doesn't increase forever and ever. We eventually reach a terminal velocity. And once we do that, that's it. There's no more acceleration in that case. So these are the two limiting cases that our final equation has to give us in order to make sense with the physics. All right, so let's go back now. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually use a little bit of calculus uh, in order to solve this equation. It's pretty straightforward. There's just a couple steps that you gotta be careful of and I'll highlight those for you. All right, so what we're gonna do here, we're gonna start by just rewriting this uh, left-hand side. This is M, the acceleration. I'm gonna write it in terms of the velocity. This is dV over dt. And then I'll just rearrange these terms over here. Minus BV plus the weight, mg. All right, next term. Actually, I'm going to make the marker a little bit thinner here. I'm going to divide through by the mass. I can divide through all the terms by the mass. That'll simplify things a little bit. Uh, these terms will cancel out. Both of those will cancel out. Uh, rewriting that expression now as dv over dt uh, equals to minus bv over m and plus the acceleration due to gravity. All right, we're just about done now. Um, rewrite this term. Just to make the integration a little bit easier, it's kind of useful actually just to factor out uh, this term over here. This is minus B over M. I'll factor that out. And here I'm gonna be left with the velocity. And now if you gotta be a little bit careful here, there's gonna be a negative sign because when these multiply, they have to give me this positive. And this term here becomes the weight divided by B. And again, you need to have these two terms in order to cancel the term in front of the bracket here. All right, now we're just about done. I'm going to go over here. What I'm going to do is the term in the bracket, I'm going to bring it in the denominator, and I'm going to bring the time over here in the numerator. So at the end, it looks something like this. And this makes the integration much simpler. All right, let's write it out. Minus the weight divided by B. All right, that term is there. And then over here, I'm left with minus B over M multiplied by time. All right, this is my equation that I need to solve. And the way I solve this now is I'm going to integrate on both sides. I'm going to integrate from zero all the way to the, the time that I'm evaluating. Let's call that T prime. And here, I'm going to assume that at time zero, that my velocity is zero. And that's true if I drop it. If I had some initial velocity there at time zero, then this term over here, uh, the bottom of the integral uh, would be V zero. And my final one will be V prime. All right, uh, the right-hand side of this is pretty straightforward because the term in the front is simply a constant. 
So all of this here is simply minus B divided by M multiplied by T prime. Again, no need for a constant here because I have the limits of integration that take care of everything here. And now this term here, you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, so this guy becomes the natural log of you substitute a V prime in here, minus MG divided by B. And again, now you substitute zero, but you still have that term there, natural log of this whole thing, minus MG divided by B. All right, I'm gonna use some of the properties here of the natural log. If I take the difference between two natural log terms, you end up taking the ratio of both of them. So it looks something like this, natural log. Now I'm gonna have a huge bracket over here. This is V prime minus MG divided by B. All of this is over the second term, which is negative, and don't let that scare you. MG divided by B, just be careful. And there, that has to be equal to minus B over M T prime. All right, this looks like some complicated math. However, what we have to do now is what we wanna do is we wanna isolate in this expression uh, the velocity term and the way you do that is by raising both sides using an exponential function that'll eliminate this natural log. So let's go on the next page and finish this off. All right, as I said, what we're gonna do now is simply raise both sides to the exponential. That'll simplify this greatly. So on this side, we're gonna eliminate this natural log. We're gonna have mg over b. We're still left with this entire term here. Same thing, minus mg over b. And now the right-hand side of this expression becomes exponential of minus B over M multiplied by the time, which I've called T prime. So all we have to do now is simply eliminate or isolate V in this expression. So we'll start off by bringing this guy upstairs, and then we have to bring this whole term over on this side. And notice they're the exact same term. So at this point, what I'm gonna do is I just write the final answer. That V prime, which is a function of T prime, at the end, you could just drop the prime values. Uh, they're not really needed. This is going to be equal to mg divided by b. And now there's kind of a big bracket here because there's two terms. And it's 1 minus exponential of the whole term that we have over there. All right, there you have it, folks. That is our final expression. Not bad. Right, only a few kind of mathematical steps and actually we get this result, which is kind of rich in physics. One thing we could do is we could say, well, what happens when T prime equals to zero? So that means that we're looking for the velocity of that object at time zero. Well, if you substitute zero, exponential of zero gives me one. So what you're gonna have is mg b bracket one minus this exponential term of zero, which also gives me one. So you get zero. How about in the very long time? What if time is much, much bigger than, actually this term over here, uh, if you, let's just say that time is very, very big. We'll look at <laughs> what does that mean in just a minute. But again, if the time is very, very big, this term over here, the second term will go to zero because it's exponential of minus something that's going to be very, very big. So that term goes to zero. The second term in this bracket goes to zero. And that means that the velocity as a function of time is simply left with this first term. And again, this is my terminal velocity. Now, if you remember this term B over M or the units of B rather, all right, we can take it one step further here. Actually, the other thing I wanna look at is, look at this term over here, this B over M. I just wanna make sure that something here is clear. This term over here that appears in the exponential, again, the entire units of the term in the exponential have to be dimensionless. So if I have time here, that means that the characteristic time here, we can call it tau, is M over B. And this here is gonna have units of seconds because it has to have units of seconds uh, because it multiplies times this guy over here. Okay, and the whole term here must be dimensionless if you're taking exponential of any function. So this is kind of the characteristic time. So although in the previous case I said that when t was tending toward infinity, 
or T was very, very long, it really only has to be long with respect to this characteristic time. So if this characteristic time is five, well, my time might only have to go to 20. It doesn't have to go all the way to infinity. All right, there's one more limit I want to take. Uh, the other limit is what happens in the short time. Instead of at t equals to zero, what happens when t is kind of small? It's non-zero, but kind of in the short time limit. So in short time limit. And again, now we have a reference point. So in short time limit, that's when t is much less than this characteristic time, which is equal to m over b. Uh, what you can do is you can expand this exponential term. All right, and that limit over here, that means that this exponential term of minus b over m multiplied by t prime, in the short time limit, this term is approximately one minus b over m t prime. So that means that your velocity in that time limit, all you have to do now is just substitute that in for that exponential term is one minus, instead of exponential, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace it by the approximate value of the exponential, which is this term, which is one minus b over m t prime. Now, if you carry that out, what's gonna happen? Well, this one minus this one, that one's going to cancel. And at the end, this negative is going to multiply with this one. So that'll turn into a positive. And then you're gonna be left with this m, it's gonna cancel with that one. This B is going to cancel with that one. And at the end, my final result in the short time limit is simply equal to little g, the gravitational, due to, uh, the gravitational acceleration multiplied by the time. Actually, this is exactly what you have in the case of no air resistance. All right, so let's just write that down. So same as no air resistance. All right, so in the final page, what I wanna do now is I wanna just give a graphical representation of what this result looks like. All right, so let's go ahead and plot this result down. So here we have velocity and my giant expression over here. What I'm gonna do now is, well, remember our two time limits that we looked at, at time zero, we had this result over here. At time zero, we had the velocity V prime was equal to zero. And the other thing we had that in the very long time limit, so that's as I'm going down over here on, along this axis, uh, what you end up getting is that the velocity tends toward a constant value. And that constant value, again, was simply given by this leading term over here. This was the terminal velocity, Vt in the long time limit, which was equal to the weight divided by that resistive constant B. Now the rest of this function looks like this. Again, it's an exponential term and this term goes away and the curve kind of looks like this. Try to make it as smooth as possible. All right, looks something like that for a sketch. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, the other thing that you can look at is what happens over here in the short time limit, right? In the short time limit, that's when T was small. Remember, if this was a case without any air resistance, what you would find would be that the velocity as a function of time would simply be equal to little g multiplied by the time. It would be linear in time. And that's kind of what you have over here. Right? This is kind of the short time limit, which we find that the velocity is little g times t prime. All right, folks, there you have it, folks. That's kind of looking at a simple model of air resistance and what happens um, to the velocity of the object uh, as a function of time. Anyway, I hope you liked the video. hope you learned something. Uh, let me know if you have any questions.